Everybody got their beverage? If you don't, we'll have a, we'll have a short opportunity in uh, a little bit of deep crowd. Thank you for coming tonight. This is, uh, this is a, a lucky night in February. The only lecture we have for February. So we're glad you made it tonight because next week it's just going to be fancy dinner and lovebirds. <laughs> Do we have anybody who's new to the club? First time to the club? Hey, we got one. Welcome. Come back. Anytime. Um, as a reminder, restrooms are up here in the upper right corner. You're right. Uh, please silence your pocket computers for me. So we'll interrupt two of your folks. Um, We've got uh, two presentations tonight, a uh, short presentation uh, from Dan Hickley uh, from O'Neill Odyssey, and then uh, we'll take a break and we'll go to uh, Doris, who's going to talk about Merlin Um Really briefly, Dan is uh, the executive director of O'Neill Odyssey. He's been working with them since 99, I believe. Um, and he... Uh, I got him to come out this evening because uh, I think the O'Neill Sea Odyssey program, from what I've heard from Dan, is, is a pretty neat program, and, and uh, I'm really excited to have him give us a brief introduction to it. And I think he's very, very good. So let me, help me welcome Dan. Thank you, uh, thank you for having me tonight, and I really appreciate uh, Doris letting me ride her wake for about 10 minutes so I can. Uh, uh, do this very brief presentation. I wanted to basically. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to continue that one. Okay. Um, um, so uh, we are serving our 100,000th student this year. Uh, it's another milestone. Last year we celebrated our 20th anniversary. So 100,000 students. And uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about what we are doing these days, whatever we are writing. Um, so as you know, for those of you who have been around the harbor, O'Neill Sea Odyssey is a science program. Uh, the centerpiece is a field trip that takes place on a 65-foot catamaran, the Team O'Neill catamaran, down here in the harbor. We operate during the spring and the uh, fall months when school's in session and we're able to get out of the harbor. Uh, our mission is to provide a hands-on educational experience that um, utilizes ocean concepts to engender ocean stewardship. So technically is to provide a hands-on educational experience to encourage the protection and preservation of our living sea and communities. It's a science program with environmental outcomes. I said the field trip is the centerpiece of it. We also have classroom curriculum that's next generation science standard aligned uh, that goes with that. Each uh, class does a community service project. The program is free and we also pay for bus transportation as well. So we have a fundraising going on. Uh, fourth through sixth grade is what we focus on. Uh, we may actually narrow that a bit because we do have some repeats, about 10%. Um, we focus on three learning stations. One is watershed ecology in the near shore kelp forest habitat. Uh, one is marine science, which is the bottom of the food web, phytoplankton, and we also focus on zooplankton. Uh, we focus on zooplankton because we don't really need to depend on grants that just focus on uh, uh, phytoplankton because their role in the food web and their role in producing oxygen for an educational program and we want the kids to see the whole gamut. Uh, we also uh, focus on navigation because it's a great way to teach mathematics and they get to learn a little bit about navigation as well which is not uh, a, a common topic in classrooms today. Um, our classroom is a Team O'Neill catamaran and our education center in the O'Neill building we're still up there, upstairs, we and the Surfrider Foundation. Um, and uh, we serve primarily an area where there's an arc, uh, Santa Clara, Santa Cruz, Monterey counties. About 47% of our work is Santa Cruz County schools. We serve about 210 classes per year. As I mentioned, each uh, class serves a community service project. We're now paying for bus transportation because schools can't afford that about $1,000 per bus. And uh, we have free ocean science curriculum that we provide. We just finished 
uh, a revision of our curriculum with the Pepper College Readiness Network, and besides uh, giving it to the schools that use our program, we're also distributing it nationally as well through that network. Uh, we're one of the few next generation science standard based curriculum packages that are out there. Most of our students have never been on the ocean. Most of them are very low income. And they actually represent the population of the student population in our area. Um, so because we don't charge, we, uh, we really get uh, the representative population that's out there. Uh, last year we served 5,281 students in 201 classes, fewer than we had hoped because we had some difficulty getting out of the harbor last March. Um, I won't talk more about that, but uh, so that sent us back a bit. Um, it's hard to try to make it up in the summer because you really don't have the academic activities going on in the summer that you can really work with. We really need the schools to be engaged academically because we are a science program. Uh, but right now we are at 96,868 students. That means that many students have left the dock and that many students came back uh, since we uh, started in December 1996. We also have something called the Adam Webster Memorial Fund that members of the club have strongly supported. This is our program for cognitively uh, disabled special needs youth and uh, it's really a chance for them to be scientists for a day. What we do with this fund is we will take groups of students uh, who have special needs. Each of them have their own uh, level of ability. So we will work with each student to their level of ability. So we will serve as few as six or as many as 12 students in one of those programs. Each one of them come with an aide and generally they come with a classroom teacher or a couple. And uh, Tom and Judy Webster started this program in 1999. We also measure our impact. Um, we, uh, we, for example, do a student survey before and after our program. Student uh, comprehension tends to rise about 16 to 20 points. Last year it was sort of 70% to 94%. Uh, we also measure by outcomes. Most of our institutional funders require metrics and we do that. It takes a little bit of work, but uh, that way we're, we're able to show that experiential ocean-based education really works. There was a long-term study of our program done by a student at San Jose State. It's actually one of the few um, uh, credible studies that are out there of outdoor environmental education. They found that students who had been through our program five to seven years prior, 75% of them retained sophisticated knowledge of non-point source pollution and some of the other units that we have taught them. And uh, factors such as other programs, other inputs, all of that was able to be factored out in this study. And if you're interested in seeing it, I can send you a copy. It's about 100 pages PDF form. Uh, there will be a version on uh, in the Journal of Environmental Education within the next year or two. Uh, we have students who often come back. This, Young man came back as a teacher. He'd been through the program 14 years ago. Uh, he was in my office with his class. Uh, he's a teacher in Salinas, buying a t-shirt. And I said, why are you so enthusiastic about this program? And he goes, well, I was here 14 years ago as a kid. <laughs> yeah, well, how old does that make me? Uh, but, you know, he really got it. I mean, his, his thesis is, you know, you can do stuff in a classroom in front of a computer screen. You can also get out of the environment. And uh, it's not the one substitutes for the other, but they both work together very well. Uh, I mentioned the curriculum online. We've done several rewrites of our curriculum. We're now Next Generation Science Standard Common Core, Integrated Science. Uh, we're actually the only integrated science product that's out there nationwide through the Pepper College Readiness Network and it's become quite popular. We're very pleased about that. This, by the way, is the watershed model. I mentioned the non-point source pollution. This is where the kids make it rain and they learn about how uh, non-point source pollution works. And this is one of the big problems we have, 5.25 trillion pieces, uh, small pieces mostly of plastic in the ocean today. Very big problem. So for the future, I mentioned we have our milestone. What we are doing is we're promoting our milestone mostly through social media. We have a Squarespace website 
where we keep up every week on the number of students that we have served last, last that week. So we're starting our program again in March when we're able to get out of Harvard. Um, and uh, so we'll post the number, we'll have a blog on there, we will send that out via social media, we will feature former students, we'll feature projects, and other very interesting tidbits. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And, uh, No, no questions? You know, brain busters for him? Question? Yes. So how does, how does a classroom get in? Good question. So every May, May 1st, 10 a.m., on the LCOdyssey.org, apply now. So you go to that link on the, on the home page, apply. And so the classroom teacher of the class, and it's for the next year, not for that year, but for the next year, the next September uh, school year, uh, apply. It's a pretty simple application, and we need to know what the class is doing in terms of science, what community service project they're going to do to do the program, and then if they need bus scholarship, they can. There's another simple application for that, and they need to they need to get on there pretty quickly because the first day we'll get 120, 130 applications. And uh, it'll fill up within a week or two. So. What kind of training do your instructors have? Uh, so they are all, most of our instructors um, are UCSC students. We have them trained in all aspects of operating the boat, of course, First Cross, uh, Red Cross. Um, they have their uh, background checks and everything like that. But we also look very closely to see how their education aligns with our curriculum and then we go through a training with them because they need to teach our curriculum, they need to be able to communicate and work with students as well as being able to understand uh, what it is they're teaching. So you can have somebody who's very good in science, that doesn't necessarily mean they're able to communicate it to 10, sixth graders, so. Are there volunteer opportunities? There are volunteer opportunities, um, all kinds of volunteer opportunities. Most of them involve events, social media. Every once in a while, we will have groups of people substitute as chaperones. So we do need to have up to nine people on the boat as chaperones. I mentioned that many of our schools that use our program are lower income. Those parents cannot come out, and sometimes the school districts require it. So we have a group of people, some of them are yacht club members who do that. So contact us. Yeah, what special arrangements do you have to make for special needs students? Well, there's a couple of things that we need to do. Number one, we need to get them on the boat if there's a physical disability involved. The other thing that we do is our education coordinator, Laura Walker, will meet with the teacher to determine, because every one of these students has their own individual education plan, and determine what levels they're at, what their cognition is. And then the arrangements will be, the instructors will meet, and figure out what their game plan is for those students. And if they are students with wheelchairs, we do leave the wheelchairs at the dock because our boat's not designed for that, but we do put them on the back bench. So we bring the program to them. Um, so those are the arrangements that we, that we do for each of those classes. And then we also have each one of those students will have, you know, generally each one has a classroom made that comes with them. So that helps. I just want to say something. I've been a fan for years and years and years. We've lived here 30 years, and 22 of those I worked at the harbor. And Dan has a special needs daughter. And the example that he sets for all of us in dealing with these kids with special needs and taking these often lower income children out for that ocean experience is something that is going to go through a lot of people. I just cannot say enough good things about Dan in all the years I've been in. And he just deserves everything.
you know, it really is hard for the schools to get uh, buses yeah. this kind of thing. So I'm really happy that you're providing that. And I yeah. know a number of people who have volunteered. And the kids really, really benefit. They've never been on the ocean. Yeah. You know, it's very hard for the parents to get, you know, the fingerprinting and all of that's involved. And uh, Dave here has been a volunteer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Do you have any relationship with the Monterey Bay Aquarium as a follow-on or a pre or anything? Yeah, it's all part of the continuum. So we work with them. So we do the fourth through sixth grade. They're doing some programs of higher uh, with with higher grades, um, uh, middle school, high school. And uh, for a while, actually, and through Randy Repass, our curriculum was used for a similar pro a pro our program, essentially, from the aquarium is called Science Under Sale. And we work pretty closely with Ken Peterson, Margaret Spring, Julie Packard, and the whole crowd over there. So yeah, it's, it's, we really, really like to have the different institutions be tuned into each other. And uh, just a segue, I know Doris has been working with education for years and she was on the Sanctuary Advisory Council for years. So everybody who does this really has to be a collaborator in that way. So. Okay. Is there a question uh, here? More folks who want to learn more, is that great? Oh, I'm sorry. So some of our newsletters and then a little flyer here. Uh, also, um, just where you can find us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, get the new oh, presentation set up, and uh, if you're patient, stay where you are. Feel free to get up and do a lap if you need. All right, should, should we be off and do another? We need to, yes. Jennifer, you should go up. Oh, it looks like the lights came on the bar. <laughs> <laughs>
And now I do my best to get as many students out on the bay on our boat as we possibly can. So, but I love what Dan does and that organization because they've got this wonderful funding program where um, literally the schools don't have to pay anything to the kids out there. So it's really great. Anyway, that's, that's what brings, uh, brings us a lot of joy to get those kids out under the water. Now, I, I have a whole lot of pretty pictures to show you because I've been out here on the bay the last eight or nine years doing lots of observations, showing people the marine wildlife out there, and we just, I've got a lot of stories to tell. And I thought about, well, how do I tackle all this? The big subject, I've got a lot, I've got a lot of pictures. So I'm going to sort of go through quickly some things that I can't help myself but do in the beginning because <laughs> you need an orient. I'm a, not just a background in sciences, but I'm also an educator. So I, I'll do some of the same things I do with folks that come out on my boat and some of you that have been on my boat. How many of you have been on my boat? All right, so you, you, might, you might find it familiar. Um, so I'll do a little bit of that while we talk and then I do have some pretty cool uh, videos and such, some new drone fish that we took that I can share with you and some hydrophone recordings interspersed here. If it comes to a point where I feel like, oh, we need a quick five minute break, that's cool, I will break, and so anybody can give me a signal if you think you need that, because I don't want to keep you all totally captive. So, with that being said, the big topic, marine mammals of Monterey Bay. So, my background is, let's see, oh, clicking the wrong thing, that's great. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> I have to start with a quiz. I told you I'm an educator. So, let's just start with this. Anybody know? Oh, I know some of you know what type of well this is, so you are excluded. <laughs> the other biologist in the room, okay? All right, if you're not a biologist, if you're just a sailor, how's that, member of the yacht club? What type of well is that? A wet one. <laughs> you know. All right, a humpback. Nope, sorry. Orca. Orca. Humpback. How many people say orca? How many people say humpback? You guys got it right. Uh, wait, that, guys got it. Which guys got it? Oh, the humpbacks. <laughs> that happens to be very well. <laughs> How about this one? Anybody know? Wow. Yeah, okay, so that's a blue. <laughs> it's just. I get asked that so many times out there. It's like, how do you tell what type of whale that is? <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Okay, so I have to start with our map of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It's so dear to my heart. As Dan said, him and I have worked with and for the sanctuary for many, many years. Actually, since before we even got it established. It's a great organization. It's a great designation to have. We. Until recently, we had a lot of federal support that yeah. brought us. <laughs> it's not funny. But I, I know why you're laughing, but yeah, I feel strongly that it's so important to have this sanctuary and all the conservation focus and the regulations to keep us from having any oil drilling off our coast. So it's a real issue, just doing that little nod so that you all realize that. Support your sanctuary. No offshore oil drilling here. No. Um, Okay, so here is our, our canyon. I'd like to show that map of the bay. Most of you, I think, are sailors that have been out and spent a lot of time in the bay. So it's really different when you see this great graphic from Mbari, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, that shows the canyon. And I'll tell you what we do when we're going out looking for whales. A lot of people want to know that. So there's Moss Landing, Santa Cruz and Monterey Peninsula. So we're coming out there and guess what? We have an advantage most of the time because we can go right out over the canyon and we work these edges. We call them the ledges of the canyon because those are areas that tend to be higher in productivity. And that means that they have more, more food, basically. They're more productive. They've got the upwelling zones coming up those edges of the canyon and we've got nutrient mixing up at the surface. We've got plankton blooms, we've got the zooplankton, the krill, and then the fish and the birds and the whales. So we usually, if we have no other boats going out, we have no idea where the whales are, 
we'll just head straight out either North Ledge or South Ledge and we'll find something. Also, look at that. Anybody know what that is? South Ledge. What? Diggity dang. <laughs> what did you say? SoCal, yeah, SoCal, SoCal, SoCal hole. If you're a fisherman or, or you're well watching captain, you call it a SoCal hole. Hole, that's what we call it, and that's where we find lots of action usually. So we just we look at this bay as pretty much latitude, longitude coordinates, and thinking about what's actually under the underwater terrain, and it helps us when we're looking for critters, as we call them. Okay. Here you're gonna get the, the teacher part of me. I, one of the reasons I've always found whales so incredibly, and all marine mammals, incredibly fascinating, is as a biologist, I go, wow, they're mammals just like you and I, yet they're living in the ocean and they're doing so well at that. Of course, this is evolution and adaptations, but how the heck do they do it? They're extreme mammals. And so I run, I like to run through this. I won't give you a quiz, I'll just, Tell you real quick, they got to stay warm, just like we do. They maintain their body temperature. Nice, thick, the lumber layer helps, and a streamlined body. And they give live birth. This is a photo I took in Tonga. And not here, but there's a baby, baby humpback whale with the mama. And so they give live birth and nurse their young. Oh this is Monterey Bay, oh. and that's an orca, an orca mama and calf. And all, of course they breathe air with lungs, that's why we get to watch whales, because they have to come up to the surface to breathe. Hey, where's the hair on a whale? Well, most people wouldn't know that, but I'll tell you. So here's a humpback whale, and see all these bumps? They're actually called tubercles, and they're hair follicles, and they each hold a whisker. So whales have whiskers. They're mammals like you and I. Yeah, they've got some hair. We're not sure what the use of it is, if it really is sensory perception still in the whales, but it probably is. Some whales have more whiskers than others. This is a humpback whale. So then I have to go to the adaptations that I find so cool. So the body shape of whales and dolphins is just so perfect for living out in the water and doing everything they need to do, like swim and catch their food. And if you look at the inside of their bodies, looking at their skeletal adaptations, you'll see, incredibly, they've lost their rear limbs entirely. That's all they have left of their pelvis. And look at that really long front forelimb. This is a humpback whale, so it has really long flippers. If you haven't been out to Long Marine Lab recently, get on out there and take a look at Miss Blue, our big blue whale skeleton and also the gray whale skeleton out there. But, and then you'll see that the long telescoped skull, and that's specially ad adapted for these large baleen whales for their filter feeding ability. They're about 25% of their length is their mouth because they're big feeding machines. Takes a lot of food to fuel those bodies. And the propulsion, the fluke, and that is a humpback whale fluke. And how about breathing air? Well, conveniently, they've got that blowhole right on top of their forehead, so they don't have to lift up their big, massive head to get a breath like we would. They can just barely peek up out of the water to get a breath. And there you go with the humpback whale again. And then the gray whales do something really frustrating for us whale watchers. They snorkel. <laughs> They'll actually exhale before they clear the surface of the water. So you don't get to see a blow, and it'll barely come up and grab some air. <laughs> but you'll see the humpback whale has two nostrils, just like we do, but they're really big. And they can actually close valves in their nostrils, so are their blowholes. When they go down, they don't get water down their nose. And sensory perception is another cool thing that I, I think about a lot with them in the water. They're mammals. How are they adapted to perceiving? Well, they do have eyes. And this, of course, they have eyes. But this is the eye on a humpback whale. And then sometimes they spy hop. And we believe they're looking out over the air to check things out. Um, but they can see well underwater as well. But really what they're good at is hearing. 
And I'm sure you've heard about the songs of the humpback whale and how sound travels through the sea so far. And one of the extremes of the auditory adaptations we see in the whales and the dolphins is in the toothed whales and the dolphins are called odonocetes for teeth. And the, uh, the dolphin is in that group, they're able to echolocate. You've all heard of echolocation, right? Yeah. All kids nowadays know what because of the movies, the, the Disney movies or the Pixar movies. Um, but here's a, a rhesus dolphin. Now look at that forehead, that big forehead. Because I'm going to go into this picture because I love this illustration. And it shows how they have special adaptations in their blowhole area to create these high frequency clicks, sending them out through that fatty melon of their forehead, specialized acoustic tissue that can focus the sounds, the clicks, like a lens. And those clicks go out into the environment, bounce off their food, and then when they hear the echoes, they receive the echoes through their hollow lower jaw and more fatty tissue at the base of the jaw. Signals transported from their inner ear there up into their brain. And the brains were pretty big, especially in the odonocetes like the dolphins, with a huge portion of that brain specially adapted for perceiving and translating sounds. So they can sort of create this 3D visualization with sound in their brain. And they do quite well with it. There's the, the whiskers for, again, I'm talking sensory perception. That's another humpback whale. So I think we're going to get ready for it to go into a review of some of our animals that we see out there. But before we do that, I do want to talk about the really specialized feeding adaptations you see in some of our whales. I mentioned the baleen whales. Their group is called mysticete, and that means mustached whales in Latin. <laughs> now, how many of you have been lucky enough to see the humpback whales come up doing the surface lunge feeding, I call it, when they come up with their mouths open. See, you know, I don't know where else in the world I could ask this question, and I get all the hands that come up like that. It's so amazing that we can all say that. And I bet some of you didn't even see that from a boat, right? How many of you have seen that from the shore, from the beach? I love it, yeah. So we've been able to see the whales coming in, feeding close to shore, doing the surface lunch feeding in the last few years. It's amazing. But this is their baleen special structure that grows from the upper jaw in plates that are composed of keratin, like our hair and our fingernails, forming a nice rim-like mat that enables them to filter feed. And that's a sideways view, showing these parallel plates of baleen, again, a humpback whale. So it's, <coughs> I really, I struggle to figure out how this particular adaptation evolved, to be honest with you as a biologist. And the ancient whales had both teeth and baleen, rudimentary baleen. But when I look at baleen and I touch it and feel it and ponder it, it reminds me of rhinoceros horn. So I just think that some tissue that the ancient whales had in their, their head, you know, started growing downwards through their jaw to create this baleen, but this evolution is amazing. And that's a classic surface lunch feed when you're looking at the throat of this whale with those big ventral grooves expanded and taking in a massive amount of water filled with probably anchovies. Those two, that's two humpback whales there. Okay, <laughs> now we're gonna go to what What's our survey of marine mammals? So I want to show you most all of the common marine mammals that we're going to see out there. Because I'm looking at this as you're out there on the water sailing and some people want to know, hey, what's that? I saw something a little different. Well, we all know what this is. So this, I hope. <laughs> California sea lion um, doing a wonderful leap. We call this porpoising when they leap like this. And Something's been happening in the last three or four years where we've been seeing huge mass concentrations of California sea lions out there feeding with the humpback whales. It's pretty amazing. Cause how many of you have seen that? Been out there on the bay and seen that? That's just incredible. So I got some, I have some drone footage I'm going to show you, but before I have to tell you a little, a little bit about sea lions. Like I get asked a lot, how do you tell the difference between a sea lion and a seal? Well, 
Who just did the sound? Do it again. Okay. Good job. If you hear that, it's Steve Ryan. Unless it's John. <laughs> but the other ones that are so vocal, they've got the little ear flaps. They're in the sea lion family, the Odoriidae. And they also, this is a, a pup and a big bull. Big bull had that bump on its forehead called the sagittal crest. And they have rather long front flippers and also pretty good long rear flippers. They use the front flippers for propulsion, for swimming. And the rear flippers, they can turn up under their body and get about on the docks and rocks and maybe even your boat. So not on boats, I'm not swimming. It's, this is a good picture because it shows a big guy up on the dock at Moss Landing and it's using its rear flipper to scratch with. They do have nails on their rear flipper or claws and then you see how long those front flippers are. The big boys, the big males get to be about 750 pounds. Now most of the sea lions we see up here in Northern California are males. However, I've got a little fast breaking news. A friend of mine was out on the wharf yesterday and she videotaped a female sea lion with her pup, and the water was clear enough, the pup was nursing. Aww. Aww. Pretty neat. She sent me the video. I didn't include it today, but Aww. didn't quite have time. Sorry. Someplace I've got, I thought I had some a drone footage for you. I hope I do. This is the, uh, what we see. Yeah, they eat fish, okay? <laughs> and, you know, I don't know about you, but I've been out salmon fishing, and I don't like it when this happens. <laughs> 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 I like sea lions, but I have my limits. So <laughs> they are really good at fishing, and it's really sort of fun to watch this. We call it mad dogging, unless that was a fish that you had on your line. And it's not fun at all. But if you're just out there and you see a sea lion come up with a fish and they're just whacking it back and forth, it's really something, and the birds are coming in. And that's how they break it up so they get swallow sized chunks. Sea lions don't really chew their food. They've got to get small enough chunks they can just swallow. Okay, here we go. I hope this is going to work for us. I'm going to try it. Yeah. I'm not going to show you this whole video, but you're going to see the mob effect of the sea lions. That's all sea lions. With humpback whales. The humpback whales are about 50 feet long. And this is all a bunch of juvenile California sea lions. This was probably about five miles out from Los Angeles in the middle of the day, but we've seen this close to shore as well. Okay, I'm going to show you the blue whale later, so let's pause that. So how many sea lions do humpback whales eat? <laughs> uh, I've seen sea lions get caught up in a humpback whale's mouth before. Right. But they couldn't swallow it. They're pretty <laughs> so they sort of spit it out, you know? It's, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to talk about the behavior because it's so relatively new. And it's been fascinating because they're cooperatively feeding together. And now there's a theory that the birds that are also feeding so, so intensely with the humpbacks and with the sea lions, they're all feeding on the anchovies, but they're all creating this I call it a feeding frenzy, but it's an event where they're schooling the fish into a tight bait ball. So, and, the, and the, for the humpback whales, that's a bonanza because they get more per mouthful. It takes less effort. <laughs> and I, and the, the force of this humpback whales chasing the, the anchovies around as well and schooling them in is helping the sea lions because the sea lions have a concentrated, they can just pick them off one at a time. Yeah? I thought it was the opposite, that the anchovies were creating their own ball in order to create a difficulty for anyone to eat them, as opposed to the other animals creating the ball. Super good point. Um, thank you for clarifying that, because a natural behavior of schooling fish, like the anchovies and sardines, is if they feel threatened by a predator, which normally probably wouldn't be a whale, they will come together even tighter in their school and form that tight bait ball. And then it's like confusing for a predator to pick one off, right? Because it's hard when there's a tight school. Birds do this too in flocks. However, so this is their natural behavior of the anchovies, the school and fish come together into a tight bait ball. But when the whales come around, 
they're causing the anchovies to go into this fear response and getting a tighter and tighter bait ball. However, the humpback whales have a one up on them because they're just going to come up, come in and take you know 500 gallons of anchovies into their mouth in one bite. <laughs> so, what do the sea lions contribute to this besides just picking off the fish that the whales have brought to the surface? Well, nobody really knows, and it's a new behavior, but they do create quite a ruckus. It's an amazing force, and I know some of you have been, like I have, out kayaking with this when it happens. And it's pretty intense to get in the middle of a whole group of these sea lions that are really fastly swimming and chasing anchovies. So they're like a, the whole mob or gang of them, that I call it, is probably creating, looks like one big monster coming after the fish. Well, we don't really know, but it's fun to observe new behaviors. Oh, this is a different type of sea lion. We don't see this one very much anymore here in Santa Cruz. But this big one, lying on the bottom, is a stellar or northern sea lion. Three times the size of our California sea lions. And we do have a few that have started um, having their pups again on Ananoewa Island. So rarely, or occasionally, I guess, we have stellar sea lions show up in Monterey Bay. And we'll have some come on the buoy outside Moss or come in and even hang out on the docks at Moss, which is really something to see. But they have a huge population crash, and so they're not doing as well as our California sea lions. And this, has anybody seen a little fur seal out there? Or if you did, you might not know what it was. These are very small little, they're fur seals, which are in the same family as the sea lions. Look at the little fur <coughs> They have a distinctive habit. It's called jug handling. Well, they'll put their fork flipper and their rear flipper together and hold them up out of the water. It looks like a handle of a jug. <laughs> now, it's so distinctive, and they're so small when they come to the bay. You see them rarely, you know, maybe a handful of times each season. But if you're out there sailing in the middle of the bay, out there where nothing, a little, little, little critter like this should not be by itself, and that's what you see. You've got a fur seal. Most of them are the northern fur seals. We have another species called the Guadalupe fur seal, too. And then we all know, and I hope we all love, the harbor seals, one of my personal favorites. And you see them hauled out on the rocks, but not on the docks. They're oh, not yeah. going to get on your boat. Oh, yeah. Do you see them on the dock? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. All the time. We have all two out here right now. Yeah, harbor <laughs> seals that are coming out from the docks? Yes. Oh, yeah. There's a big difference between harbor seals and sea lions. Yeah. When sea lions lay on the dock and you go like get and they just jump on the water and get off. Uh -huh. There was one morning I'm getting ready to work off the dock and I, I go to do the same thing. It was a male, a big male harbor seal. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, harbor seal. And so he, he looked at me, jumped, hissed and jumped and snapped at me, jumping in the air. After. Really? <laughs> okay. And sea, lions, sea lions would not do that. Oh, I, I've had sea lions come right at me when well, I'm trying to get down on the dock. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. Anyway, let's. I can still tell you the differences between seals, two seals, and sea lions. And if you look, they have a smooth, smooth head. You don't see there any ear flaps. They've got ears, of course. They just don't have the little external flaps. We call them pinnae. Uh, they usually have pretty big whiskers and really chubby, chunky bodies like a fat cigar. They can't put their tail Right, they can't get up, they can't put their rear end up underneath their body and sort of walk around like a sea lion can, so they're just not as amphibious, I'll call it. They, they're much more um, awkward trying to get up onto the beach or up onto rocks. They usually use the tide, you know, or the waves to get them where they need to go. They generally have really big eyes, big, big whiskers, and when they when they surface, a lot of times, whoops, you just see their um, head pop up and then sink down like a periscope. So that's the harbor seal. And they're quiet. They're just some grunts, but they don't make a little noise. Okay, now, how many of you have seen elephant seals out there in the middle of the day? You know, I mean, I'm not surprised I didn't see a whole lot of hands raised because when I see an elephant seal, I have about 30 seconds to a minute to make sure everybody on my boat has seen that elephant seal and then it's gone. Because they're the super divers of 
are marine mammals. They can stay down for over an hour. They only come up to the surface for five minutes at the time and at a time to retank up on oxygen. So when they're and this is what they look like when they're at the surface. You just see this head and this nose, this big nose, you know, just stationary, poking up. And then once they're down, you're not going to see them again. So the females also. Um. Yeah, we get the ones I see out in the bay are not the, the adult males. I see juvenile males and females. This is a, a juvenile male. That I just have a few shots of what you would, would see of them on the beach, which I'm sure, I hope everybody's been up to Anya Nuevo or down to Piedras Blancas. Now's the time. Here's a hint. You want something nice to do on Valentine's Day. That's the best time of year to see um, mating elephants. Yes. <laughs> And the males will be fighting, and they'll, and they'll be breeding with the females, and it's very cool. Anyway, I can tell you lots of stories about elephants, though, because I got to work with them at Long Marine Lab, but I'm not going to, because we haven't even gotten to the cetaceans yet. And of course, the sea otters, the most endearing, adorable of all of our marine mammals. Nobody can argue with that. So, <laughs> and they're one of the main reasons we have the sanctuary. You know, we have about 3,000 sea otters in our population here, and we're very lucky to have them because they were hunted for their very thick, precious fur to believed extinction back in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. So we're so lucky that very few survived down the Bixby um, fridge area and discovered when they built the highway down there in the 1930s. So from that population that was only about 30, now they've now we have about 3,000. And you know what? That's not so great. It was discovered in the 1930s, and here it is, 2018, and we only have 3,000. Last year we had a decline. They're really highly studied and monitored. How far north of Santa Cruz can you find these fish? I'm in Nuevo, and there, there's probably some that want to go a little further north now. There is a problem that they're not expanding their range, and they're, they're not recruiting. That means they're not increasing their population like we would like to see for really healthy rebound, and one single oil spill could potentially or likely wipe out our entire Sierra population. So that's why, you know, personally I feel oil drilling is, would be a horrible catastrophe to wild on our coast. But the sea otters, but I, yeah, so the sea otters, we're lucky to have the ones that we have, and like I said, they're being monitored and studied really carefully. Sort of a interesting note is that almost Half of the sea otters that are found dead this in the last couple of years have been from great white shark bites. Yeah. So we don't have anything to do with that. But, um, so here you go, the sea otter, they have the thickest fur of any mammal in the world. It's a million hairs per square inch. And they rely on that layer of air that they keep in their fur to insulate them and keep them warm. So if their fur gets soiled, then they can die of hypothermia. They often get that, oh, I didn't do my inter introduction about my photos, so now I will because looking at this beautiful photo by Chase, I'm not the photographer. I wish. Uh, I have two, three super photographers that come out and, and actually work on our boat. And Chase is one of them, and he just takes marvelous wildlife photos. And that's so you're getting to see their work. And I have most of them credited to here. Mothers and pups. We do have pups all times of the year. We can see lots of moms and pups right in Elkhorn Slough. Pretty much the best otter watching area you can have. And they eat up to 30% of their body weight every day, so they've got a really high metabolism to keep their little bodies warm, engines running hot. And so this otter is eating a Benjamin's crab, which we see lots of going on in Moss Landing. They also eat a lot of clams and mussels there. And newly, we're seeing in the last couple of years a lot of the fat innkeeper worms. That could be a good or bad thing. It could be that their other food now has been a little bit decimated. There's a lot of otters feeding in the slough. If they're out in the kelp forest feeding, they'll be feeding on all sorts of invertebrates like sea urchins, abalone, snails, and things like that. And we have one weird otter, and I don't have a picture. 
but it eats birds. Yeah, we have an otter that has learned how to hunt for birds in the slough. Yeah. Does the whole gas issue affect them at all if there's a crab? Yeah, genoic acid has been shown to affect sea otters too. They're highly susceptible to all sorts of toxins, human created toxins in their environment and also natural toxins. And so they have been taken in sick and suffering from genoic acid poisoning, as have most of our pinnipeds, the sea lions and um, fur seals and such. And we suspect that the demonic acid has worked its way up the food chain and actually does affect the whales as well. We know it affects the birds. Yeah, from 30 to 3,000 seems like a massive uh, experiment in inbreeding. Absolutely. Has there been any side effects to that? Not that anybody is specifically no, aware. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, guess yeah. I know, but it does cause, it gives you cause for pause and you wonder, you know, what if one particular disease or toxin or something affected that they were all susceptible to? And the other animal that's even worse with that one would be the elephant seals. Because we don't even think there were 30 of them left. So yeah, so our northern elephant seals were believed to have been extinct. Um, and, and then a small group survived and now we've got many thousands of elephant seals but all from the very same gene pool. Didn't they bring some sea otters down from Alaska and plant them here? No. No? It's a good question, but we did, um, a, a colleague of mine did a lot of sea otter translocations, trying to, to get them established back into their territories right here in California. San Nicolas Island was his big project, and when he was, when we were both at the marine lab working on it many years ago, it was not successful. The sea otters would tend to come back across and come back to the mainland. But now there's a, a small population of sea otters out at San Nick Island, the Channel Islands, which is good. But it's really difficult to relocate sea otters. And as far as I know, they didn't bring any down from, from Alaska. There are sea otters in Alaska. It's a different subpopulation. So um, we call ours the Southern or California sea otters. And in Alaska, there's a they're all the same species, but a different population, and they don't mix. It's a lot of miles between here and there. Um, since you mentioned it historically, the sea otters used to range from Japan all the way up around Alaska, Russia, Alaska, and down to Baja, Mexico. That's the big range. So we're lucky we have them here. Oh, you know, some interesting new behaviors we see. We've got a few sea otters that come up onto the docks now at Moss Landing. Have you seen them come up onto the docks here at San Cruz? So, um, and some of them, you know, I get a little worried about them, and I watch and watch them, and it turns out, I think they're just old and lazy. I mean, we've got one, I just called the retired, the retired otter, just figured it out, you know, nobody's gonna bother, right? You know, I gotta walk around it to get down the dock, so. <laughs> yeah, so here's just, we, we have this little raft in the North Harbor, we call it the Boys Club, because it's young male sea otters, and you know, this is a great, Thing to do is to get out there and kayak and um, I've got my, my kayak and kayak and compadre here in the back Kim she runs Blue Water Ventures if anybody wants to go out on a kayaking trip it's a good thing to do all right we're finally to the whales okay so the whales dolphins and porpoise are called cetaceans and let's begin to start we'll start with dolphins so we've got bottlenose dolphins that are along our coastline. I'm sure you've all seen them. You see them coming out of the harbor, you see them from the beach. That's an interesting scenario in that I remember when they were first sighted here, maybe some of you do too, and it was probably in, um, I'm gonna take a gander, in the late 80s or early 90s. We had an El Nino event, and we had a population of the bottlenose dolphins that showed up here in Monterey Bay from Southern California, and then they just stayed here. And from that small group, they've expanded, and now we see them, you know, in any given place, you could find them every day along the beach right out in the surf zone. So that's pretty cool. Um, the long beak common dolphin, or a dolphin that comes into our bay, great numbers, but they're very seasonal. They're more often found in Southern California, 
and we, I found a variation from year to year. I would say we normally see lots of them in the winter time. This year, I haven't seen them in the bay in the winter time. This winter, so I don't know what's going on. This is something we call the dolphin stampede. Anybody know why? <laughs> why would they stampede? What is scaring them? Yeah. Orca. Yeah, if I ever see, see them do that, I know there's orcas around. Um, I do have a, a vocalization here. Let's see if I can get it going for you. microphone in the water and get recordings of the different mammals if they're talking. And whenever there's whenever there's common dolphins, they're talking. You can hear both their 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 whistles, their communication whistles, and also you can hear some of their echolocation clips too. Well this is one of my very favorite dolphins. It's the uh, Pacific white sided dolphin. We used to have a, a four of them at the marine lab. And we got to help uh, take care of them, and also we were doing some behavioral observations with them. And they're fairly common out in the bay, out in the deep water of the bay. They love to bow ride. And they're really zippy and really, really fast. Here they are bow riding. And from these dolphins, whoops, back to them. I can give you one anecdote that was pretty cool. Um, people always wonder, how the heck do whales and dolphins sleep? Well, we were wondering that many years ago at the Marine Lab, and we happened to have a perfect scenario for sort of testing this out. And we decided, how about if we just stay up all night, night after night after night, and we had underwater observation windows, and just observe and videotape and record what was happening. So that's what we would do. And guess what we found? They'd be in a tight group, the four of them, all tightly together, swimming the same way, swimming really slowly, and each of them would have one eye closed. They never closed both their eyes. They always had one eye closed. They've got a theory, how they, how they sleep. Well, the theory was they put half a brain, one hemisphere, to sleep at a time, and they take sort of half, half naps. And we were able to pretty much prove that by these observations we were doing. And here was something else. Which eye do you think that they kept open? If you were in a, in a school of dolphins, and dolphins really do rely on staying in their school, you know, safety in numbers. A solo dolphin's in trouble out there. So which eye do they have open? when they were sleeping. The Not the eye that looked to the outside, no, the eye that looked into the group. Yeah. Really? Yes. Yeah. They didn't so they, they didn't lose the group. And then they would change positions, yeah. They didn't alternate left eye and right eye so that they, everything slept eventually? No, they would change positions in their formation. So then they, they could have their, their other eye, they have their other half of their brain to sleep. So it's pretty cool stuff. So consider yourself lucky if you run into these dolphins. They're usually out in deep water. They're really quick. Uh, I don't know that they would ride the bow of a sailboat unless you were going super fast. We were going super fast. Yeah, yeah they, they like it if you're going super fast. And they ride the bow of the boat and have a great time. And then the recess dolphins, sort of our most reliable, dependable dolphin out there on the bay. The recessed dolphin are the largest ones. They're 13 feet long. And I call them the tattooed dolphin. You can see why, right? Look at all these squiggles. It's like they carry record of their whole life, all their social interactions and feeding interactions on their bodies. When they get scarred up, either by another dolphin scratching them with their teeth, the social thing dolphins do. You know, they don't have hands, so what are they going to use their teeth? Um, yeah, dolphin graffiti, that's cool. Oh, good, yeah, tattoos, graffiti. And also they feed on squid. 
and so they have very sharp beaks so they can also scratch them up but i really like everyone has individual squiggles and scars on them they don't repigment for some reason so are those permanent yeah yeah it's yeah so it's really cool and you can actually um, right now there's a uh, woman studying them their social interactions and doing photo ids out in the bay from moss Landing marine lab and she's able to get such good photo ids because they have such distinctive scars on them yeah so the rhesus dolphins are pretty distinctive um they've got this sort of tuxedo like marking on them and i love them they do this this they come up halfway out of the water and slap down on their sides and they look like they have a permanent smile <laughs> Is this a year-round population? Yes, it is. I wish that I could tell you where they're going to be in the bay from one day to the next or one week or month to the next. I can't. Sometimes they're down in Big Sur and they're not in the bay at all. So, but they still are the most, over the whole course of the year, year after year, they're the most reliable whale, our dolphin that we'll see. This one shows the squiggles really well, huh? And that big, big melon of a forehead. Okay, this one we don't see very often. It's called the Northern Right Whale Dolphin. And I don't know why I got that name. I like their scientific name better, Lysodelphus borealis, so I just call them lissos. And this, this is a leaping lisso. And what they do is they leap out of the water, that's that porpoising behavior, and look how skinny and streamlined they are, and they don't have a dorsal fin. And nobody knows why. They also have a white pattern underneath, which I didn't bring a good photo of that, but you can sort of see the reflection and see the white there. And then the porpoise. We have a couple porpoise in the bay, the doll's porpoise and harbor, por harbor porpoise. You've probably seen harbor porpoise if you've seen a tiny little porpoise outside our harbor here. They come in shallows. The doll's porpoise will be out farther in the deep water, and they have a white sides black on top, sort of a mini orca coloration, and this is called the rooster tail. They swim so fast and they put up a spray of water in a very distinctive pattern, so if I see some splashes out there from a distance, I can tell that they're, they're um, dolls purpose. Their population numbers have really changed. I used to do marine mammal surveys for the marine lab years ago, and I'd see them on almost every trip. And for the last decade on the water, I, we rarely see them, so. I think their populations have now moved north to colder waters. They're more colder water species. Okay, I'm going to have to tap the pulse of everybody. Does, that, does anybody want a break? Okay, mm -hmm. only one person. You lose out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are to the to the to the big guys, the big blues here. So I think uh, we can keep on going. Um, the blue whale. Now, blue whales are not uncommon in our bay. This is, shows the blow, 20 foot tall blow. They're definitely, we have, seem to have a lot of fame for our blue whales. Everybody wants to see the blue whale um, as part of their, uh, well, when I, when I get customers on the boat, it's like a bucket list thing, which is interesting. It's like everybody wants to see a blue whale. They're cool, they're like 80 feet long, they're huge. I personally like humpback whales better because they're more personable, I think. But the blue whales are pretty impressive. And this is distinctive. How do you tell a blue whale? It sort of looks like a submarine when it's coming up. Its fat goes on forever. Depending on the lighting conditions, it can be the same color as the water almost, the grayish color. If it's sunny out, you might see a little bluish, a slaty, slaty blue-gray color little little tiny dorsal fin there now blue whales are really specialized feeders they're baleen whales so they do the filter feeding like the humpback whales but they specialize in krill let's see there's the krill now that krill looks huge in reality it's only about a half inch long and we have these massive krill blooms that happen out here on our bay when the conditions are correct. We have to get that nutrient upwelling coming up to the cold water surfacing, mixing with sunlight. Everything has to be in alignment, and then we get these massive krill blooms. 
And then that's when the blue whales come in to feed. It used to be, let me show you what a swarm of krill looks like on the surface. Because if you're out there and you see something like this, a mass of orange on the surface of the water, you probably see birds around it too, and maybe even whales. That's krill. It gets so dense, it, cut, it turns the surface of the water orange. They're filled with beta keratin, like carrots. And it's pretty darn impressive. It's just that it's so episodic for us to get these really big, dense krill blooms. And that's what blue whales require. Blue whales are out there. There's a decent population off our Northeast Pacific, but they're out there in the deep water, moving about between krill patches, searching for their krill. When we get a good krill bloom in our bay, they will come in, and I am absolutely convinced that they communicate this to each other. Because this is what's happened in the last two years. I'm going to go back to this picture because I like it. Okay, so the last two years, this year, in November of all things, we had this invasion of blue whales. We had about a 10-day period where we had 20, 25 blue whales feeding out there and right in the outer bay on krill, along with humpback whales. That was unusual to have one in November. The year before, it was in May, and it was in the Soquel Hole. Maybe some of you got to experience that, because it was about a 10-day blitz of feeding frenzy with about 20 blue whales. And then once they've, they've depleted that krill, not enough krill is dispersed, those blue whales take off and are gone. Now, you might see one or two blue whales throughout the year, mostly in the summer, but you're not going to see the big events except for when we have those big curl blooms. It used to be that we had those big curl blooms in the summer pretty reliably. And then that warm blob came in. Remember that? Yeah, we had a couple years of that crazy warm blob of water. Didn't have any curl in the bay, at least not enough to feed blue whales, and we didn't have any blue whales coming in for a couple years. I was sort of worried. and But it, now it's sort of turning around, but it's not reliable like it used to be. Like, oh, come out in July and I'll show you a blue whale. It just sort of depends on what the krill's doing. But I like this photo here because it shows how they can expand their throat pleats out, like a big balloon, like a tadpole shape. And they really increase their body volume by 50% doing that, and taking a massive amount of water. And they'll use their massive tongue to push the water out and capture the krill. The baleen is that hanging down from the top there. So, so why would they share with other blue whales where the krill blooms are? Why would they just say to themselves, oh my gosh, there's only 12, 20 million krill left. I want them all to myself. <laughs> you know, that's a really good question. But here's my take on it. It's because a krill bloom is so ephemeral, it's just going to be a short-lived event. They reproduce so quickly, and they disperse them quickly. So if you don't share it with other blue whales, then something else is going to eat it. So that, that's what I'm thinking. Like, they, they may as well, and, and because if I find my, this huge patch of krill, and I communicate, and by the way, blue whales make the loudest vocalization of any animal on the planet and it can travel for literally hundreds of miles through the, the water column. They, if, if they communicate it with their buds, <laughs> blue buds, then the, uh, the others will do the same for them and they'll all be better off for it. Because this, this patch is, they probably, maybe they couldn't eat the whole patch by themselves. And I'm just, this is conjecture. This is me hypothesizing. And I, I make an analogy because we, you know, us whale watcher, watcher boats, we all talk to each other. And if we find a blue whale out there, I'm going to let somebody else know, hey, I got a blue whale out there. You want to come out and show you passengers? And that way, everybody's happy and we're sharing. And we all help each other out. And it's a different sort of thing, but it's... Yeah, but you're not having lunch. <laughs> well, uh, got to pay the bills. <laughs> I'd rather, I'd rather find a whale than eat lunch. So. Oh. <laughs> the whale's having lunch. Yeah, I know. I know. No, it's a really good question. And we, we don't really know. So how do us civilians who are out there looking around the bay to show our friends some whales uh, tap into your network? 
that Chase took of a blue whale. So look at how skin, it, the body looks so elongated, a very different body form, very streamlined than say a chunkier gray or humpback whale. And they are really fast and they can just swim like a torpedo through the water. And as I said, they go hundreds and thousands of miles between food patches. They're just very efficient swimmers and feeders. All right. Get ready. Nope. Get back here. <laughs> Come on. Oh no. I'm trying. I hope this does show up for you. Can we give it a minute? There we go. You see how it's like a big submarine coming up. And it's amazing to see from overhead. It's so different because when you're in the water, just watching from water level, from sea level, you see that back come up. It's pretty impressive in the blow, but you still get to see the full breadth of them like this. Were you out there in this location? Yeah. is coming up for air. Um, usually when we have blues here, they are here to feed. And so it's taking so many breaths, retanking up on oxygen, and then going down to do some more feeding. And krill isn't always at the surface like I showed you that picture. Often it's way deep, way deep, 300, 500 feet deep. Not very far for the blue whale to go, but um, they're diving and eating, and then they come up and reef retank up on oxygen, they've got to do that. I didn't even mention that as an amazing adaptation, that how long these animals can dive. You know, the mysticete whales, the baleen whales, are not the record divers, but still, they can stay down for 20 minutes if they need to. They have to get enough oxygen in their body every time they surface, just filling up their body with oxygen. They have lots of hemoglobin, much more than we do per volume of blood for attaching oxygen molecules. And also, in their muscle tissue, they've got myoglobin, which attaches oxygen. So they can just store so much more oxygen per body volume than we can. And that's one of the ways to do it. OK, I have three more types of whales we've got to talk about. Is everybody up for it? OK, All right. So gray whales, they're the whales that we're seeing migrating by now. Have any of you noticed them from shore recently? Yep. Yeah, I'll tell you something that's happening this year. Um, they're farther, they're farther out than they have been in the past years. Mm -hmm. None of us know why. But so we're not seeing them come in and hugging the shore on their southbound migration like they have been. They're farther out. Frustrating when you're trying to get out to see them and show people. But, um, this is what, uh, this is taken from Big Sur, actually. <laughs> a clip in Big Sur looking at them from above. You can get good vantage points at Big Sur. And their migration, look at that, December through May. So really, there's many months of the year we can see gray whales. <coughs> and I am thinking of, this is their typical, this is their migration pattern. They are feeding up in the Arctic Ocean above Alaska in the Bering and the Chukchi Seas, and they have a specialized feeding adaptation for bottom sediment feeding, where they're sucking up the sediment from the bottom in the rather shallow waters up there and getting invertebrates. And so they concentrate their feeding in this really 
short period in the summer when there's no ice out there. And then they migrate all the way down to Baja, Mexico, to the lagoons of Baja to have their babies. This is something that's reliable. Like I was telling you, I can't rely on blue whale seasonality anymore. I can rely on the gray whales migrating by at the same time every year. It makes me feel good. <laughs> so we start seeing them in early December heading southbound, and we'll see them all the way through about mid-February heading south across our bay. And then late February, we're going to start seeing the early northbounders going back up. So they have a staggered sort of migration, depending on how old they are, where they are in their reproductive pool, and you know, if they're a female giving birth, if they're a juvenile, they all have a different, different times that they migrate. But it's a, it's a constant stream, and then we'll have a time between February and early March where we'll have them go both ways, maybe, or mostly in February. Then the mothers and the calves are the last to come north, and that's, they're coming north in um, April through mid-May. So I do want to, here's a cool picture that you can see the eye there. We had an interesting thing happen, happen this year, I think it was about two weeks ago, Kim, where the one came into the harbor. Yeah. yeah, we had a little gray whale come right in, not to this harbor, to Moss Landing Harbor. And Kim was lucky enough to have, have be on a kayak and see it. We saw it from the boat as it came out of the harbor. So sometimes they, they get confused when going to the harbor, isn't that crazy? Um, we not often see spy hopping. It's fun to see when they come straight up. They are way more active in the breeding lagoons, and if you ever have a chance to get down there to Mexico to the breeding lagoons, you should go do that. And this is, uh, this is <laughs> breeding, which is a little bit hard to, yeah, but if I see gray whales that are rolling on their sides and splashing, that means usually they're having a little bit of fun. And that does happen. We see that happening on their southbound migrations. It's like they don't have to go all the way to Mexico to take care of business or pleasure. Um, so now we go into the little x rated here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Valentine's Day kind of. Okay. So this. This is a trio. They're usually doing this in trios. We think it's two males and a female. And this is out in mid Monterey Bay in February, I believe this picture was taken. And there you have it. No, January, I remember. And there's the old Pink Floyd, we call it. And I probably don't have to tell you what that is. But it's impressive when you get to see it. And we don't see that too often. <laughs> and then this. Kim recognizes that. Yeah, she. I think this is your picture, not mine. Kim. Sorry, I didn't give, but I'm telling everybody. Kim took this. We were uh, down in um, Magdalena Bay in Baja, and we got to see that. And that that was uh, out at the mouth of the lagoon and frisky whales, and there there it flashed us. That was right after we all was capsized. <laughs> that was an exciting trip. Um, and we weren't in my boat, we were in little pongas. You go out with the Mexicans in their little pongas to go see the gray whales. And the cool thing about that is, I do have to mention this, you've seen pictures and heard, maybe some of you have experienced it, the gray whale calves will come up and approach these little ponga boats and actually solicit interaction, physical touch from humans. And this is a new thing, it's only happened in the last 20 or huh, maybe 30 years, that a new culture, I'll call it, a new culture. And these young gray whales come up and interact on their own volition, and the mothers let them, and they get, let people pet them. Amazing. And I, I just put it down to the fact that all mammals, especially young mammals, are curious and playful, and why not? You know, they figured it out, they're safe, it probably feels good, and we're probably pretty funny to them. So, so there's your gray whales. Oh, okay. Um, I guess I'm switching over to orcas here. That's not a gray whale fluke. That is a uh, humpback whale fluke. And so I'm mixing up, we're going, going back to the, the toothed whale group and going back to the dolphin group, actually. This is a humpback whale, and see the marks on it? 
and the little cut out there. This whale, as a young whale, was attacked by a pot of orcas. Those are orca teeth. So. Now we're going to talk about orcas. Orcas, my favorite. So, we call Monterey Bay Orca Alley. In the springtime, when the gray whale mothers are bringing their calves north, they come across Monterey Bay, they have to cross that canyon, and it's deep water, and the orcas know it, and it's a really advantageous spot for a pot of orcas to come and kill the gray whale calf. Last year we had five or six known, observed, baby gray whales killed in Monterey Bay in a very short period of time, maybe 10 days to two weeks. I mean, it's sad, but it's nature. Um, and so if you want to see orcas, get out on the bay, you know, reliably. If you spend enough days out on the bay between April and, and early May, you'll probably find orcas. It's just that you have to be prepared that you might see, you know, a National Geographic special. <laughs> um, here's the, they're transient orcas, and this is a subgroup of orcas called the transients that we find off California waters and they all feed on mammals. They're predators feeding on mammals. Let me see if I can, no, maybe I can't. Okay, there we go, that's what I wanted to show you. So. Orcas, there's three different types, we call them ecotypes, they're not quite subspecies yet. We have, I don't even know that I can show you well enough here, so maybe I'm going to skip this. Let's go back and let's listen. We had an incident where we had a pod of orcas, we came upon them after they killed a baby gray whale, and they were feeding, and they were feasting. And so, I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping I can get this to play. Sorry for my, I'm gonna give it one more shot. This is the last shot, we're gonna wait. <laughs> Let's see. come right at our boat all, all porpoising like that, amazing. Orcas can be incredible animals and they're also, you know, they're apex predators of our sea. And they even take out great white sharks, by the way. Here we see more often than the baby gray whales getting killed, we'll see sea lions and seals getting killed. And this is a, behind all the splash is an orca. You can see the white eye patch there. And it's tossed that sea lion up. I don't have any gory pictures, don't worry. <laughs> There's that dolphin stampede, and that's what happened. They separated one, and good old John Carlo got the picture. Yeah. So what they do is if they can get a, a smaller mammal, they'll flip it up into the air, and it's pretty spectacular, because you'll see this poor little dolphin or porpoise or sea lion go flying, and then of course this, it gets so stunned when it hits the water that they, they get it. They have a feast. Uh, sometimes, though, they play with their food. And so this is a little harbor seal that, unfortunately, is about to meet its demise because it's being surrounded by a pod of orcas and a cooperative hunters. 
And sometimes they're trying to teach their young how to hunt. And then they take a really long time. That's hard to watch, I gotta say. Um, I'm not gonna show you that. That's a video of a poor little harbor seal that got tra trapped at the boat. Here comes the orca oh, sorry. on the surface. Okay, I'll let you just see. Yes. Coming up, coming up There's one. Here's the baby harbor seal. And there's that orca again. They're surfacing all around our boat, looking for that little seal who's right here down in the water. And guess what? That one they didn't kill. So there you go. That's not a happy ending. No, it really is. <laughs> Oh, did anybody watch Big Blue Live? Yeah. yeah. Because that that was videotaped from another boat and got on to Big Blue Live, that particular segment. Um, so are there any threats to the boat? I mean, they're big, aren't they? No. Not our boat. I mean, our boat's 43 feet long. Yeah. If I was in a little inflatable and, and the, they were frenzying around me, you know, I might have paws. And yes, I've seen them come up, a big bull orca come right up underneath their friend's kayak. And that's scary. Yeah. So, but they've never tipped over a kayak that we know of. No. That's a different story with great white sharks around here. We had two times this year where great white sharks tipped over kayakers. A whale tipped over one in Hawaii in December. Guy without kayaking and um, the whale came up underneath and flipped him off. Wow. But he was okay, I guess. Yeah. Because it was a gentle humpback whale, I Um Yeah, so here's a, a pod with a, with a baby. And we see these very distinctive pods. They're called matrilineal. The females, the oldest female is the head of the pod, and several generations of young stay with the grandmother, mother of the pod. The males will leave the pod to go meet and then come back to their mamas. So, really interesting. Uh, this is very, very cool. So, here we go. I don't know if you get that out. Oh, I'm sorry. What did I do? I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> This was recently, this last fall. Watch these orcas playing. They found a little seabird called the rhinoceros aqua. And there's no gore here. It's sort of funny. See the little bird? Well, I don't think it was funny for the bird. Mammals are playful, and in particular, you know, orcas. They were just playing ball with that, with that little bird. You know, they probably had their bellies full and nothing else to do. And this is just uh, one of the best shots Chase has taken from our boat, and it's just showing a stunning coloration. And this is a, a big male 
orca, you can see the very tall, probably six foot tall dorsal fin that they have. If you ever see anything like that surfacing from the water, you've got orcas out there. Very distinctive. And then the males have these very big paddle-like front flippers, and they have a tuxedo pattern there. See, coloration in whales and birds and other marine critters can be really distinctive, and it can make it for pods of of whales like the orca that have to stick together tight with their pod, it can be uh, really helpful that they can see each other flash in the water with this coloration, especially when they're coordinated hunting like they do. All right, we're going to go to our last whale. So I'm going to save the best for last. Humpback whales. Now they there are go-to whales here in the bay. I want to. I always uh, like to put this in perspective because back in the day, in the 80s and the 90s, I was at the marine lab doing, and part of my work, I got to do marine surveys out on the bay. And we would never see humpback whales. Never. I don't remember once getting a humpback whale on our surveys. I do remember some, a few times seeing humpback whales breaching from my trailer office at the lab. But we just didn't encounter the humpback whales back then. The reason why? So the populations weren't up yet. All of our great whales were whaled, were killed, hunted to almost extinction. And that whaling went on full force in our bay in the 1920s on humpback whales, 1940s on gray whales along the California coast, and then way up to the late 1960s when they were still taking whales. The last whale was taken in 1969 and brought in to Richmond, where the last whaling station was. So when you were buying, if any of you bought dog food in the 60s, 70s, your dog food probably was canned whale meat. Hard to believe that that's, that was the case. Um, so now that they've been protected, now they're coming back and we have a lot of whales. We have a lot of whales. People wonder about the humpback whales all the time about their migration. So I'm going to show you this quickly. Our whales are the California humpback whales. They go down to southern Mexico and as far as Costa Rica to have their babies. If you saw whales in Hawaii, they go and have their, they feed in the summertime up in Alaska. Sort of a complex map, but there's Hawaii to Alaska. The different breeding populations. And I'm just gonna really quickly show you a few pictures of humpback whales and then up, I have one more drone footage that's fun. And then we'll wrap this up. Okay. So, what are they feeding on? Can you tell? Yeah. So, oh, so it tells you. <laughs> that wasn't a very good question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so this is the, the surface lunch feeding, and the krill is so close to the surface when the whales come up, the krill just goes flying. It's really cool to see. And this is really neat to see the inside the upper <coughs> roof of their mouth, the palate there. And then, mostly though, the humpback whales are feeding on anchovies. And the anchovies have been doing pretty good, at least they've been schooling, swarming close to shore in Monterey Bay for some few years now. And one really cool thing, I've been able to record their feeding calls. Right after you hear that, that heard that big screech, 
they all come up like this with their mouths open. So my take on this is they're coordinating their efforts. Maybe they're stunning the, the fish with their vocalization, but they're coordinating their efforts and using sound to corral the fish. That's pretty cool. Just a, a few more images because we do get to see this amazing behavior of the surface lunch feeding regularly on Monterey Bay. And often you see lots of birds. If you're out there just, you know, wandering around the bay and you really want to find whales, look for the bird flurries, the bird frenzies. Sometimes you see them from afar before you can see the whales. And then get over to those birds and you might have this event happen. The birds all sitting on the surface, nah. and then all of a sudden oh. they take off, and then the whales arrive. How do they oh. know? How do they know the whales are coming? Oh my gosh! I, because I'm, I'm sure they can sense just the movement of the water. Yeah. Oh, you know what I've seen is pelicans. You know how the pelicans circle around and they're getting ready to dive. Oh, I've seen pelicans just doing it, and they're all ready. And they start their diet, and then all of a sudden they go, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and then the whales are like, yeah. Maybe, maybe next time. Yeah. <laughs> Bad timing. Oh, this was very cool. Gray whales feed up in the Arctic. They do sometimes feed on their way, but it's not, it's so incidental. When they're migrating, usually they're not feeding. One day a few years ago, this was in March, I think. We had this gray whale that came in right in front of Moss Landing. That's the gray whale. There's a humpback whale. That's a fluke printer. The humpback whales were feeding. They were circling around, chasing anchovies, and guess what? That gray whale joined them. <laughs> and it was totally in sync with the humpbacks, and we watched it for a long time. And then the next day, it was doing the same thing. So I am sure that that gray whale was getting in on that action and feeding, which is unusual. I've talked to other well, biologists, nobody's seen that before. Opportunistic gray whale. You know, one very cool behavior I have to mention because I, I like the new behaviors we're seeing. We're seeing humpback whales coming in and trying to avert orca attacks. Uh, so I have seen that happen when orcas are attacking gray whale calves, when they're attacking sea lions and when they're attacking another type of whale. And the humpback whales come in and sort of charge the orcas as a group. Mm -hmm. And they trumpet, they make this great sound at the surface, and they're really agitated. And it's the only way to explain it is it's almost altruistic behavior. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, uh, we had a, a boat demasted. I'm sure a lot of people remember the black Moor 24. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was that likely a humpback? It was there's a whale. It was a whale that demasked the boat. Yeah. I, it was, yeah, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we had a kayak that got, um, a, a whale breached on the kayak a couple years ago now in front of mom. And I, I was there, I saw it. And I, my interpretation on that was there was probably too many kayaks close to a feeding event and the whales were in a frenzy and feeding and I don't know what, I, either the whale just didn't notice and didn't know the kayak was there or maybe it was agitated. I don't know. But uh, fortunately that doesn't happen too often <laughs> and the people were fine. So. It was like the pressure wave of, of the, the air pressure of the, the breaching whale when it came down on right before it hit the kayak, it pushed the people under the water and they were, were, went down below safe. They were in, safe because the pressure wave pushed them down out of harm's way. So this is a sea lion feeding with a humpback. And I knew I had something to show you. There we go. And that, this is a, a cool footage of humpbacks feeding. And you can see them circling around and you'll be able to see them come up with their mouths open. Look for the dark patches. There you go. 
you can see this, this school of fish. It's like the dark marine patch. See the sea lions? There's the fish. to the end here. But, but this is showing you how close to shore they get. Oh, yeah. It's right in front of Moss. And this year we had it right in front of Rio Del Mar and it was there on the Pacifica doing it. Oh, some quick behaviors that we see is the, the tail lobbing, slapping with their tails, slapping with their big, long pectoral flippers. This is all humpback whale behavior. And of course, the breech shots that I showed you, sometimes chin slapping. This is why I like humpback whales, because they can have some really cool behaviors. And then, of course, the classic breach. We're always wanting those breaches. And that's one of my fave shots. That whale's coming right at us, water coming out of its mouth. That's amazing. Oh, one more thing. Sometimes we get friendly humpback whales. Oh, gosh. It's so awesome. They come right up to the boat and they will just want to hang with you and they'll spy hop. These people are not touching this whale. It's too far. You know, if it was close enough to touch, I would have to say, no, you can't do that. But um, still, it's pretty darn close. And they would call it mugging when the whales come up and they sometimes will hang out under our boat, they'll come up on each side of the boat, they'll spray people. <laughs> That's a calf that was spent about an hour with us would roll over and look at us. You can see the eye right here. And they're just curious. That's all the only thing I can say about it. And it only happens maybe a handful of times a year. And it, but it's the best of the best when it happens. Uh, somebody mentioned the whale fluke identification. And I wanted to point out, this is at happywell.com site. Okay? And you can go to that site, and this is a local guy, Ted Cheeseman, has done a database online that you can take a picture of a whale's tail fluke, it's a humpback, because they're so distinctive, and upload it into his website, and it will actually have fluke, it does have fluke recognition <laughs> software. And it can match the whale, if it's ever been identified before, with a photo and tell you which whale it was and where it was sighted before, maybe even if it was a female that was seen with a calf. So it's a pretty cool sight. And there's those tail flukes are just so distinctive They're with their white and black patterns. A lot of them you can really tell individual whales. This is our boat. This is Sanctuary. We went out of Moss Landing. Now, we don't take that many people anymore. Yeah, it does look like a lot of people. Uh, we're allowed to take 49 people on our, I'm sorry. 39 people on our 43 foot boat, but now we only take never more than 33 people. Um, and anyway, that's sanctuary. So if you want to go out whale well watching sometime, I've got flyers here, and you all know how to find me, I do believe. And that's it. And when I, well, I'm going to close out here just because I always have to do this. This is a video that Kim provided. We got to go swim with humpback whales in Tonga. One of the few places in the world you can get in the water and snorkel with whales. So I'm, um, I'm just going to have this on in the background so you can see an amazing encounter we had in Tonga a year and a half ago, something like that. A year and a half ago, yeah. Um, and because it's, it was really quite something, we actually had friendly humpback whales swim with us. Let me see if I can get this to start now. <laughs> Here we go. So I'm going to take questions. I'm not having the music up. You can watch that behind. I can take some questions. Yeah. So is there a population of whales that's taken up permanent residence in the bay? Um, humpback whales. Really good point. And I'm, I'm, he asked, is there a population of humpback whales that's taken up permanent residence in the bay? 
And I wouldn't say it's one set of whales, but in the last three years, we have had small numbers of humpback whales staying all winter. Instead of migrating south to the breeding grounds in Mexico, they've stayed here to feed. And we, prob we have somewhere between, probably about 15 of them in the bay now. Um, on any given day, it might be range from eight to 15, and a lot of them are young ones. So that's a new behavior. Yeah. Do we ever get sperm whales in the bay? I've only seen, all my time out here, I've only seen um, two sperm whales. But we do get them, and there's an acoustic array that Ambari has out there that is getting um, sperm whales um, vocalizations. Not too irregularly out there. Yeah, this, let me explain. So these are friendlies. And they're actually, <laughs> they were a little bit too friendly. But <laughs> I, I was a really, really had to work, work at back, back paddling so that I wouldn't have a close encounter with their pectoral flipper or their tail <laughs> flip. <laughs> but um, anyway, if you're ever interested in going to, uh, on a trip like this, Kim does lead trips and she's here in the back. So it's a pretty amazing experience. Any other questions about our Monterey Bay whales? How, uh, how good are you identifying uh, spouts? I hear that you can identify a uh -huh. whale based on the spout. Yeah. Right? Yeah, usually I can. The gray whale is a lower, bushier blow. I call it the blow, not blow. the spout, because they're not blowing out water. It's their hot, moist air from the lungs that's condensing when it hits the surface. A little bit of mucus in there, <laughs> and it smells. But the gray whale has a bushy blow. The uh, humpback whale, it's a, a blow that's about 15 feet tall, and it all depends on the wind conditions, too. And the... Uh, blue whale, 20 feet, and it's a much taller column that sort of fluffs out at the top. I mean, if, the, if there's no wind, it's easier. So yeah, you sort of can. And orca has a blow. It's just smaller and narrower. So OK, let me see. Back of the bar. Well, it's coming out of the lungs. Why does it smell so bad? <laughs> yeah, isn't that a good question? Um, it's interesting because their air passageway is not like ours. You know, we have a sort of a direct connection when we breathe out. You, if you burp, you could smell it, right? But the whales, air passageways aren't like that. There's not a direct connection to the digestive tract. But there's, the theory is that the bacteria that happens when they're digesting their food along with just the essence of the food permeates their bloodstream so much. And of course, your lungs are interacting with your blood and, and the chemicals. I liken it to, say, somebody drinks all the time. And even if they haven't been drinking, you know, that day, they still smell like alcohol. <laughs> yeah, look at people are pointing at people. <laughs> but I think that's like, this, these whales are eating anchovies every day. And, and if the smell of the breath is like rotten broccoli. It's a really weird and mixed with anchovy smell. I mean, a lot of us have smelled it. It's very distinctive. Yeah, stinky. We, we, I have one whale we named Stinky. You could smell it before you saw it. Okay. So when you drop these listening devices into the water, is it likely that you'll always hear whales going on, or is that kind of a rare event? It's rare. I wish it was likely. Um, with with my hydrophone, there's there's a lot of things that are restricted for it because I really can't. I, I can record with other engine noise, but it's really disruptive to the recording. So really, if there's other boats around, I won't drop it in. We have to turn our engine off, of course. So the conditions have to be right. And then even if you've got you're surrounded by whales, they may not be vocalizing. That's the truth. And if you're surrounded by dolphins, yes, you'll hear something. So, but not the not so the whales. What what kind of like it's a very specialized and expensive recording equipment, or is it? Yeah, it's it's a very specialized professional grade rig. But I also have uh, just one for regular teaching. It's not expensive at all. So you could get one of those and have it on your boat, and it, you could probably get it for maybe. Five, what do you think, Kim? About $200, yeah. So um, you can even hook it up to your 
iPhone. Or there's little digital things now. So yeah, it's fun to have. Oh, I believe it's communication for sure. Um, yeah, when we see them tail slapping, usually I think they're communicating with other whales. And there's, again, it's all theories. You know, maybe they're trying to digest their food, move things around. We don't really know. Yeah? The recordings that you did, were they, and you played back for us, were they frequency shifted, or is that no. actually. Let me see. You know, actually, I think maybe we did frequency shift the uh, common dolphin one, but certainly not the others. Um, yeah, I'm not positive. See, I know, you know, I can hear the common dolphins just, you know, when I plop it in, I hear it. But there's some other dolphins, like the recess dolphins, I have to frequency shift it. You have to translate it, get back to back home and lower it yeah some of them are so high you just you couldn't hear them with your regular ears and then, then you have to frequency shift it down but the humpback whale recording you heard that was what i heard and that orca whale vocalization that was crazy because i didn't have my professional rig i just had that little teaching one and i i put it up to my iphone and did a voice memo and got that that's why i had all the interference but it was amazing because i I've, I've tried to record orcas a lot since then, and I've, I haven't been able to get that that sound. I, I haven't heard it again. But it's just one of those things. Any other questions? So how good is their eyesight up in the air compared to... I don't know. <laughs> I wish. I You know, I don't, we haven't been able to test it. No. Yeah. No, it's, it's still I know. Of no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I had some colleagues at, at the Marine Lab that were working with um, posted seal vision and were able to do a lot of testing, but these were trained, trained, highly trained, I'll say, <laughs> seals that were able to follow commands and, you know, respond. So to be able to do that with a, a wild um, whale would be pretty much impossible. <laughs> so there's a lot we don't know, but I mean, we're really, really fortunate to be living here in the Monterey Bay and to be, have such a wealth of wildlife here and have our wildlife thriving like it is. So, great. Nice talking to y'all.